Uh, okay, thank you all for joining us. Um, hopefully you caught some of that extremely sensual uh, guitar music uh, guiding us into our event tonight. Uh, my name is Cassandra. I am um, a 2022 curatorial fellow with the Poetry Project, and this is the third and final installment of the Utopian Research and Development Summit. Um, this program was rescheduled from November, so I am uh, tremendously grateful that um, this duo of like film buff, archival interrogator, historians of the most like pressing and unrecorded film history, um, Yasmina Price and Elizabeth Burchell are here to join us for this program on cinematic reimagining. Um, we are recording this event tonight, so if you're on camera, just make sure that you look extremely hot because you are, uh, you know, a public representative of both me and the Poetry Project. This is very important. So, like, if you need to go change your outfit, if you have to, you know, like, go freshen up in the bathroom, like, please do take a moment. Um, the Poetry Project is the only still existent American literary arts organization to have hosted acid punch sex orgies out of a church rec room. And uh, since 1966 has served as a crucial jumping off point for geniuses of both every and no discipline. So please help me um, thank our project staff, James and Anna for helping to run this event tonight. Um, you'll see them in the chat periodically. So definitely um, profusely compliment them. They're um, very helpful geniuses. The Poetry Project is committed to everyone having a safe, fun, and accessible time tonight. And we will be dropping a statement about this into the chat. And you should also feel free to message Anna if there's anything that we can do to help ensure that this is possible for you. The Poetry Project sits on stolen Lenape land, and I live in Kansas City, where colonizers stole land from the Kansas, Shawnee, Osage, Kickapoo, Otto, Missouri, and Delaware people and where government chooses every day to sustain the violence of colonialism, racism, and poverty by ignoring the housing, healthcare, and incarceration crises in our community. This country has destroyed so much life and possibility, but what we can collectively promise in this space is that we will work with every moment of not only our art, but our lives to fight colonialism and imperialism and to reject and dismantle the power and borders of America. And last but not least, we will be dropping a link to donate to the Poetry Project in the chat. Um, the project actually compensates the artists and writers that they support with programming. So if you can donate, consider throwing them um, some money. Otherwise, they may have to go back to the acid um, punch sex parties, which um, maybe isn't a bad idea. You know, um, I'll give you that. <laughs> so to kick things off, the Utopian Research and Development Summit is a relentless demand for utopian existence that is predicated upon a collective engagement. My utopia is porous without your love's careful contributions, so please use the chat liberally and with abandon and feel free to ask questions or participate in a way that fulfills you and your needs. Um, each reading will be followed by five minutes of free writing time or chill out time, bathroom break, whatever you need, and after which we'll have some time for you to ask questions or share um, with the presenter. Uh, so our first presenter tonight is Yasmina Price. It is endlessly the case that Yasmina Price knows what to do with an image, knows its exact weight and power and potential, knows that its tiniest pivot can be as revolutionary, as regressive, as reconstitutive. As such, in Utopia, she's the director of the Museum of Lost Films, an institute that wills every misplaced or thought to be gone forever real back into existence. Under Price's careful eye, this happens with ease. We find what we most need at the most crucial moments. She has long known the emancipatory possibilities of cinema, that a film might crack order at its seam and leave a limitless time and space in its wake. The intimate, the experimental, the avant-garde, always the films of those at the margins and silenced by a colonial, racist, sexist, cinematic unimagination. There is space finally for these modes to assemble and disassemble, to destroy expectation, to become as messy or capacious as they need, and to assert endlessly that a radical image can be as simple as a face or as complicated as a revolution. And it is Yasmina that teaches us in the quiet serenity of an unlit room, the fissure of possibility might arrive in a single image of daily life or militancy or love. Uh, 
please join me in welcoming Asmina Price. Thank you, Cass, not just for the invitation into this dreamy space, but for the most beautiful bio I've ever been honored to be held by. Um, there were, what I hope to present has taken various shapes. Um, at a certain point, it was going to be a bit more cinematic in form, um, but now I regret that it is only a Word document that I will be reading <laughs> for you. Um, and that's, that is what it is. It is untitled, um, and I kind of wish it were unauthored. Um, so, a portal opened in 1804. The Haitian Revolution tore through the fabric of the colonial world, and slavery was abolished in a choreography of Black liberatory rupture. This insurrection challenged nothing less than absolutely everything. In the Black Jacobins, Toussaint Louverture and the San Domingo Revolution, CLR James located the kinship between political autonomy and spiritual practices. He wrote, quote, at their midnight celebrations of voodoo, their African cult, they danced and sang. The colonists knew this song and tried to stamp it out and the voodoo cult with which it was linked in vain. For over 200 years, the slaves sang it at their meetings, end quote. The revolution was whispered in languages illegible to the colonizers. The revolution began its song and began in ceremony. This episode of world breaking and world making could not have been recorded cinematically. Yet what would develop into the technology of film was entirely entangled in what made Haitians unfree to begin with. The Berlin Conference took place in the late 1880s and occasioned the division of the African continent into the colonial possessions of European empire. The late 1880s also saw the birth of the machineries that conjured cinema, a form of seeing shaped by colonial, imperial, white, Western, Euro-American project of domination. The camera was a way to classify the lesser other, to create a virtualized form of territorial expansion, to force the so-called peripheries into the knowledge systems of the so-called centers to secure sciences of superiority. There does not exist a cinema that is not in some way mechanically, materially, metaphysically tied to this history. In recent years, film has appeared to turn or to return towards an obsession with archival material, a new old archive fever. At its best, this is the unruly, unpredictable, unauthorized process of breaking down, unsettling, shocking, those histories which present themselves as authoritative, as universal, as securitized. The emancipatory dream of these filmic exercises is a collective surrender to the messiness of time. They could be one way of abandoning the rigid comforts of chronology and knowing that there is no singular telling of what came before, no firm map of what will follow, and remembering that the dead and the done are always with us. This cinematic archive fever collides with turning up the volume of apocalypse and dystopia in mainstream cinema. Electrified in some ways by the pandemic, but unquestionably preceding it, the big Hollywood machinery has been caught up in an ugly exorcism, generating hand-wringing about apocalyptic or dystopic futures, ideations of barren landscapes, ecological devastation, cities as war zone, aggravated forms of precarity and vulnerability, water wars, sharpened social hierarchies, brutal, brutal poverty, and the list goes on and on. But what is truly sinister is that they cast these scenarios onto an imaginary future. But we are after apocalypse and we are inside dystopia. Obviously, I don't know if the worst is yet to come, but how dare anyone even suggest that we have not already seen and lived through unimaginable hell. Over several centuries of Euro-American imperial expansion, more than three quarters of the world was colonized. The global majority are populations that exist in whatever sometimes diminished forms because they survive something I don't believe it is too much to call apocalypse. Many of us are descendants of peoples whose entire worlds were destroyed. They were destroyed multiple times over and we have lived through cataclysm after catastrophe, after apocalypse, after genocide. Unfortunately, dystopia hardly requires any imagination at all. And then how strange that the dream factory of Hollywood would be working overtime, maybe especially since the early 2000s, to produce dystopian cinemas as an act of invention. 
Looking towards recent production to make a case for dystopia as a genre of film is so easy that it ends up making the seeming non-existence of utopian cinema all the more apparent. But it might also be that whatever you hear and I would call a utopian cinema can't quite exist there. And by there, I mean as a genre in a drop down menu or as anything that is likely to be advertised in a theater near you or identified quite so openly in a state of extreme surveillance. If there was and if there is and if there will be a utopian cinema, where then could it live? But if it is true that we are in a time of a filmic archive fever, then we begin to answer that, by que that question by looking back. Looking back, but also looking outside of the immediate parameters of cinema and towards the uncontainable experiments in freedom we might call utopian practices of living. Because whatever utopian cinema might be, it would be one of many cultural, artistic, aesthetic expressions of a devotion to a shared existence that would spill over into everything. The explosive emergence of the Cuban Revolution, the retreats of the Combahee River Collective, the communalism of the Move family in Philadelphia, I'll give it to the Paris Commune, Burkina Faso in the time of Thomas Sankara, the young lords occupying a hospital in New York, the liberated territory of the Zapatistas, the survival programs of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. These were never perfect and they were certainly not permanent, but they were dress rehearsals, they were experiments, they were materializations of what I believe is the closest thing we have to look towards as something like utopia as an everyday practice. If utopian is a word to contain how we might totally transform everything, what better model than an organization of young black people who took on the state, who were armed and who were militant and who also centered their service to the people in a way that would ensure that small children were fed every morning and that community elders got their medicine every night. There's a historical tidbit that I love, um, which is that Giro Ponte Corvo's 1967, The Battle of Algiers, which remains a keystone of revolutionary filmmaking, was also a film that the Panthers watch as a source of instruction, which really honestly freaked the fuck out of the Pentagon. And so cinema might be a vessel of teachings. It matters also that the Battle of Algiers and this sequence of suggested materialized utopias all took place in the 60s and the 70s. And without falling into romanticized nostalgic traps, we might gain something from looking to those decades in the search for the possibility of a utopian cinema. And maybe third cinema is a synonym for it. It was then, beginning in Latin America, a form of cultural warfare, making of cinema a visual sonic weapon against colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism, and a way for the peoples denied by the dominant world order to find each other. My suggestion that these were utopian cinemas is not, however, content-driven. Content is not irrelevant. The emancipatory possibilities and political explosiveness of third cinema was definitely located in the ways it documented and cataloged the cultural pluralities, the revolutionary struggles, and the modes of being of communities that not only defied colonization, they far preceded it. But third cinema was also oppositional in its production, in its distribution, in all the critical functions of film that are so far beyond just the projected image. And a utopian cinema could not put a utopia on the screen if it was made on the strangled and suffocating terms of a dystopia. And I'll say from this litany of utopic meanderings that I don't mean to singularize the 60s and the 70s, because if we look to Black British filmmaking, its most utopic era might have been the 1980s. The horror of Margaret Thatcher's England brought on a series of riots and rebellions, and as state and institutional bodies tend to do, these were answered by funding cultural activities, which did lead to the emergence of a number of Black filmmaking collective whose disobedient, gorgeous, insightful, messy exercises in aesthetics and politics really did break free. And speaking to the coexistence of temporalities we mistakenly take as separate, one of them, the Sankofa Film and Video Collective, named themselves with an Akan word for a mythical bird that signifies the act of looking to the past to prepare for the future. And one more thing about third cinema, it sprung out of a feverish groundswell of manifestos in its blood, a deeply utopian form of writing. The manifesto with its imaginative urgency is an incantation level towards the future and a form of what Lyman Tower Sargent called social dreaming. 
Meanwhile, Dana Poland has said that cinema made dreaming a social event. And so these are the dreamed commons, spaces of speculative collision where the visions of the masses, multiform and never monolithic, have room to unfurl in waves. Dreamed commons whose activities of looking inwards and looking beneath are not privatized and individual, but grounded in an elastic relationality as forms of encounter in a shared project of reforging the bonds between us, between our labors of living and between all this and the land we should not own, but take care of. And as I was doing um, a little reading to get in the mood for this, um, one of the evident recurring touchstones for where utopian studies meets Marxism is Frederick Jameson. And honestly, archaeologies of the future is bars. Um, and he also obviously did not invent that. Um, and formulations along the lines of remembering the future are embedded in many systems of knowledge across the global south, amongst all sorts of indigenous peoples, and are a constant antidote to making the mistake of thinking in lines and in grids when we have circles and spirals. And these notions of remembered futures are essential for how they instruct us that the past, history, memory, archive, are always part of the arsenal of what we have in the ever evolving now to weave the cosmos again, again into something made to the measure of everyone being fed. And we also always need to look back because we need to have a lucid understanding of what was taken to know what is owed. I personally have no interest in reconciliation and I'm sometimes lost in what reparations could be, but I do believe in revenge. Revenge in the form of an apocalypse from below. And that is maybe one way to look at the Haitian Revolution as an ap apocalypse from below, because it produced the end of one world and from there it promised that another could begin. Utopian cinema for the purposes of utopian cinema is the ocean screen on which we cast our visions for an outside that would be in some way the end of this world. In 1920, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a short story called The Comet. One way to read it is as a lesson that the end of the world is the precondition for Black liberation, which is to say for liberation. The many worlds of Samuel R. Delaney and Octavia E. Butler offer us riffs and remixes of Afrofuturism, speculations on Black queerness, rethinking kinship, loving ambiguity but honoring some hard lines, self-reflective criticisms, transgressive forms of desire and eroticism, elastic forms of learning, world-breaking, and world-making. Wilson Harris has claimed that we suffer from illiteracy of the imagination, and maybe in the same way as Sun Ra, as Grace Jones, as Thelonious Monk, as the alien poets, utopian cinema can also be a cure for this. Utopian cinema is a glitch. It's a weird experiment towards collectively produced cosmologies. These would also have to be cartographies, dynamic and living remappings, which lead to other orderings of history and offer us that bit of latitude to infuse what really happened with signs pointing to what else could have happened. Because utopic filmmaking would be a refusal to agree to the terms of the dominant visual order and all of its violence, it would give us different things to watch, yes, but it would also help us see everything differently. Fluid and changeable, it would have something like the architecture of abolition, destroying, tearing, and burning down, not because those are ends, but because those are beginnings. Utopian cinema is memory work, and here I think of what Toni Morrison named re-memory in Beloved a black and a broken memory, feeling the grief of absences and ruptures, but revisioning, revising, letting the ways the past and present always touch be felt as something which leaves a mark on both and is the task of relational rhizomatic shared being. We summon utopia from the absent archive as an apocalypse from below, dancing and improvised choreographies because even as we don't know how we get there, yet we owe each other everything that awaits in the engulfment of liberation. Like many, I look to Nina Simone for her incandescent beauty, for her sonic unleashing, for her devoted visions of an open horizon, and because I also wish I knew how it would feel to be free, and I wish we all did. In the middle of his 19... <clears throat> 56, Cahier d'un retour au pays natal, a text of lyrical revolt, the poet Aimé Césaire, who looked to trees for what they had to tell, and who was in plural ways a dream maker, wrote, Il faut bien commencer. Commencer quoi? 
La seule chose au monde qui vaille la peine de commencer, la fin du monde par bleu. One must begin somewhere. Begin what? The only thing in the world worth beginning. The end of the world, of course. And so, cast on static and fluid screens, that vision, when we need it together, is utopian cinema. Uh, thank you so much, Yasmina. Um, such a, a beautiful and also like um, revelatory presentation. Um, I love the cinema that generates a new way of seeing entirely. And um, we all deserve the revenge that we deserve. And I hope we get it. Um, okay, so we're gonna take five minutes um, to do some free writing. If there's something that like, you pulled from that presentation. If you have a tangential thought, if you need to go use the bathroom, like please take this time. Um, feel free to put things in the chat if you have any questions um, for Yasmina. Um, she can answer now or like when we come back um, or you can come on screen and ask if that's appealing in any way. Um, and so I'm gonna start. We have um, some utopian writing music that was provided by a musician named Isabel Bess. And so I'm going to play that and um, we'll all take a little bit of time.
All right. Um, I'm going to drop a link in the chat um, to Isabel's music, um, which she uh, composed specifically for the Utopian Research and Development Summit. If you want to listen to more of her work. Um, does anyone have anything that they would like to ask Yasmina or share? Otherwise, I'm just going to call on someone random in the chat. Just kidding. I would never. All right. We'll, um, we'll just sit with our beautiful questions. Um, thank you so much, Yasmin. I have so much to think about. Oh, people want you to expand on Jameson. That's that's not very utopian of us. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm as politely as I can declining because of the things I reference. That is one that is the first uh, audience. I'm like, I just love that phrase. I'm sorry. Um, I love um, I love you. Ooh, I like this one. Can compassion be considered as the basis of utopia? Oh, I think it should be. I really, really do. Um, I think something I feel strongly about in terms of what what cinema, the, the way that cinema is a gift in the same way that poetry is a gift in the same way that meeting your friend for coffee is a gift is because I think that there have to be um, there have to be ways that we are towards each other that doesn't that doesn't fit into the formal grammar of this is a communist utopia this is a particular formalized you know th these are the structures that we're working through um and i think there has to be a real and difficult and likely frustrating and maddening love for each other i think that's the only i think that's the only way um and, and because I think that there's a form of compassion that comes from a real sense that I, I cannot live well if you cannot live well. Um, and those real senses that we are surviving um, for each other only. Um, Jonathan also says, my spiritual teacher says it is the force that gets us out of the ego and it is also love in action. Mm. That's beautiful. You have a good spiritual teacher. Um, I love it. Um, and then we have uh, how Marxism meets utopian thinking. I think Marxism can be one scaffold for it. I think all sorts of things can be but I think I I am more I am more devoted to the places where it's a plurality of the possible architectures because I don't think that anyone will ever give us that full open horizon totally utopians maybe um yeah. Okay, Helen says, a question I've been sitting with, for those of us who live in dystopic empires and make films, where do we begin? How do we untangle ourselves from the grip of Hollywood? Um, I think, unfortunately, the a core place where that will exist is in the financing and the funding of all of it. Um, and I think it's a... I think you have to decide ahead of time the compromises that you are not willing to make. Um, and I think the untangling from Hollywood is refusing refusing the terms of value of what comes from there, which is to say that you might not be able to make a big production. Um, it might not get a theatrical release. It might have to be the thing that you harass your film hating friends into attending with you um but I think that it also I definitely a lot of space to honor the individual the soul makers the I just need to do my thing by myself but I think for the most part if it's about the big vision of what filmmaking can be otherwise I think it all has to be collective because 
whether we're looking at the 60s and 70s, third cinema, Latin America, all of those guerrilla explosions or 80s Black British. But I think even um, something that I know you're familiar with, Helen, which is the extraordinary work of um, No Evil Eye, also called Film Futura, which is a gorgeous micro mobile cinema, an autonomous pedagogical tool for learning how to re-see. Um, and it is a collective project. So I think it's getting it's getting your weirdos together, pooling whatever you have and making it on your own terms. Totally. Okay. How did you become interested in utopianism? Is it uh, in relation to any political projects? Um, well, Cass summoned me into the <laughs> utopian research and development project. Um, and so I answered. I don't think I'd ever thought about utopia that much beforehand, but I realized that maybe the things I thought through channels that are utopic are things like Afrofuturism, speculative imaginings, um, and I think a stubborn refusal to accept that this is all this is the only way we can live, um, because I don't think it is. Absolutely. Um, yeah, do we have any other questions? These have all been fantastic. Um, okay, we are going to um, move to our next speaker. I'm very excited to have this combination of brains because I think the two of you are so good at like digging through history to, to find out like what the present should look like and what the future can look like. And just in these like completely different fields, but like with the same levels of like passion and um, the same kind of like, um, just like totally brilliant uh, interrogative styles and so um, I'm really excited for this combination of thinkers. Um, so our next uh, speaker is going to be Elizabeth Perchill. It goes without saying that utopia is full of perverts. In fact, utopia may be entirely devoid of non-perverts, those who cannot feel their way around a darkened room or try on new and revolutionary forms of wanting, needing, fucking, and feeling. In Utopia, Elizabeth Perchell is Desire's historian, scouring history for the kind of longing that creates crucial throughways, the kind of embodiment that makes having a body bearable, and the kind of fucking that is as nasty as it is liberatory, as it is fun, as it is, as it is utterly chaotic and real. She sees traces of life in each touch and glance and askew mouth, and she is a student always of backdrops, of the where and how that make the who so vibrant. We are lucky to have Perchell as a guide through the darkened theater where everything is up for grabs, where we are able to remake ourselves in our wanting, where discomfort melts into certainty that we might finally live for a moment in some bliss, whether temporary or terminal or terrifying. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Perchell. Thank you so much for that intro. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, so, I guess just to begin, I'm someone who thinks about movies a lot and not just in terms of their actual content. Sure, narrative and technique and whether or not something is categorically good or bad or if it encapses can tell us something about ourselves or the time in which it was made. Those things are all important, but as a film historian, as a filmmaker, as a film, as a freelance film programmer, and as someone who works professionally in film for distribution, what really fascinates me is the conditions in which these films were originally shown, where they were, where they played, how they were marketed and sold to potential audiences, and how they could potentially be revived and repackaged and brought back to new audiences. Queer film programming is, I, I think, in a really sad state right now, and it has been for a while. Movie theaters will only show perhaps one queer film a month or one queer film a calendar or one queer film a year in June for Pride Month, of course. And rather than trusting that audiences will want to come out and see and discover films they may never have heard of before, programming rarely ever scratches beneath the surface of the established canon. Uh, a Paris's burning brunch with a custom cocktail here or a one-off of the birdcage with a pre-film drag show there. I think programmers generally severely underestimate just how obsessed queer people often are with movies and how hungry they are to see some version of themselves and their communities on the screen. But it wasn't always this way. Uh, imagine, if you will, and 
here's the, the basis for my little utopian idea. A movie theater that played queer movies all day, every day, with new movies coming in each and every week. It's not heaven, it's a gay porno theater. On June 28th, 1968, a heterosexually oriented nudie theater in Los Angeles called the Park Theater decided to try something that nobody had ever done before. It went gay with what it called a most unusual male film festival. While the occasionally vaguely gay themed late show wasn't unheard of, especially in Los Angeles where the Park's sister theater held a series of midnight campouts featuring Hollywood camp classics and beefcake physique films throughout 1967 and 68, this was the first time one that had ever taken the sizable legal risk of going full time and proudly publicly flaunting its new queer bent. And because the idea of gay themed films and theaters was so new, the park had to get really creative with its programming. Uh, for example, in that opening month, you could take in a show of Shirley Clark's Portrait of Jason with Andy Milligan's Vapors and uh, something called Boys Out to Ball and New Desert Safari. This was probably the one and only time in history you could go see films by Jack Smith, Kenneth Anger, and Andy Warhol play on the same bill as nudist beach boy surfers and interlude in the desert, something I'm sure the original filmmakers wouldn't have minded. Despite the oddness of the programming, the festival was a huge hit. Gay theaters quickly began sprouting up in major cities across the country, and more and more filmmakers began making movies that could play in them. By the time the Stonewall riots kicked off the gay liberation movement in June 1969, American already had its own honest to God fame, its own honest to God gay film industry, and it only got bigger as softcore gave way to hardcore the following year. So let's just take a quick tour of some of these theaters across the country. You have the Vista Theater, which during its near decade long run as one of Hollywood's premier gay porno palaces, was owned by a nice heterosexual Greek couple who'd prep a sandwich buffet for their weekend world premiere events and show a Greek family matinee once a month. Uh, the family, uh, the theater is now owned by Quentin Tarantino who uh, hopes to make it a family movie theater. There's also New York's Adonis Theater where you could go see Jack DeVoe's film, A Night at the Adonis and yes, make it with a man in the balcony while watching gay porno superstar Jack Wrangler make it with another man in the same balcony on the silver screen. Or the Hollywood Century Theater, which presented its films in the revolutionary new screen process known as Ultravision, meaning they put steel shutters over the projector to make it look like the films were meant to be shown in widescreen, even when they weren't. Filmmaker Tom DeSimone once told me about a time he got into an argument with the theater's manager because all the characters in his film's heads were chopped off and uh, people were confused why the film looks so bad. There's also New York's Big Top, which offered an ongoing gay soap opera called, what else? Mary Marvin, Mary Marvin, with new episodes debuting live on stage between movies every two weeks. As wonderful as this may sound, there were downsides. The theaters were often trashy, rundown flea pits cheaply run by heterosexuals who often cared more about profiting off of a minority community instead of trying to build and foster it. Gay porno theaters charged a then unheard of $5 admission fee, inspiring zaps and protests from various activist groups. Pickpockets and vice raids were common occurrences, and while sex was openly available and frequently encouraged, it's probably safe to assume that most participants abided by the usual no fats, no femmes, no Asians, no blacks, no anyone but able-bodied white men code that carries on to this very day. As an example, here's what Vector Magazine entertainment editor Noel Hernandez had to say about San Francisco's Tomcat Theater in a 1972 piece. The Tomcat with its garish 1950s straight-ish display billboard, see the shocking world of the gays, is by far the most oppressive, depressing theater imaginable. A virtual hole in the wall, it is in need of major facelifting and renovating. However, its dingy, dirty, dilapidated state probably effectuates and enhances the atmosphere the owners want to create. An aura of third-class citizenship, something outside and beyond even unconventional convention, a situation wherein the audience has no rights and the management has no responsibilities. Where else could the projector break down an average of three times per two hour show and the audience sit mute and dumb up to 10 to 15 minutes waiting for repairs? Obviously, this audience has, does not feel it has even the right to exclaim in a revolt against such shabby service. Let the projector break down at the war field and the audience will be hooting and howling within the first 15 seconds. So while the reality of these theaters didn't quite always live up to their promise, 
I do think there's something so powerful of the idea of the cinema as a dedicated queer space. In one of his last interviews before his death from age-related causes in the mid-90s, gay porno superstar and original daddy Richard Locke mentioned getting letters from men all across the country telling him how they drive hours away from their wives and families for the weekend just so they could see one of his films and be in a space where they could truly be themselves, if just for a couple of hours. Imagine having the ability to go to a theater at any time and on any day of the year and being able to see a movie with some aspect of your life. The kinds of clothes you wear, the way you socialize with your friends, the places you might cruise or hang out, or of your fantasies, the type of person you want to be or be with, or the kinds of things you want to do or have done to you, blown up on a big screen and watched with a receptive audience. While I'm often wary and very conscious of the nostalgia trap that porno films present, uh, despite their very historical their very real historical and documentary value, and the fact that they do show the real thing, they're all just fantasies and not representative of real life in any way. I can't deny that there's something really intoxicating about the world that they present and the conditions under which they originally screened. Watching early trans porn films like Sulka's Wedding or Dream Lovers as quote unquote research showed me that some what are now some of my most cherished depictions of trans women on film, gorgeous, wanted, and perhaps most of all, normal and having existed decades ago. I'd rather be alive in who I am now than at, at any previous point in history, because trust it probably wasn't easy to be either a gay man or a trans dyke in the past, but I do wish there were some way to bring back this type of venue and improve upon it, clean it up, uh, not sexually, and make it more about community care and safety where the specific needs and wants of queer people, not just artistically, but personally and socially are taken into account. A place for us with free sandwiches and coffee for the weekend premieres, a disco themed bathroom, and a lounge behind the screen for getting to meet people. That's it. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Wow, I have an extremely pressing question, which is just, is the secret to utopia to um, trick people into thinking it's extremely sexy? Um, <laughs> and then we just <laughs> move it right in. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, we're gonna have the same time for like Q and A uh, stuff, but we're gonna take another five minute break um, to do some free writing and uh, leave comments um, in the chat. And then we will reconvene uh, for some last thoughts. Let me get, um... okay, last time I had baby zebras on screen, but this time um, I did a Google search for beautiful sunset and it was not, um, it was not the search that I wanted. The sunsets, I feel a little uh, ripped off. So I'm gonna uh, go back to baby zebras. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, we are back. Um, I found my favorite baby zebra during this free writing session, and it was the brown one that has um, polka dots and said so, uh, rare polka dotted baby zebra discovery. Um, if you missed that, I'm so sorry for you, but <laughs> I'm still looking at it. Um, okay, we uh, will take another second um, for Elizabeth to get back. Um, there's a plug in the chat to um, ask anybody, which is something that's like so fun to follow in all of its many forms on Instagram and as a podcast and as a website um, for a lot of uh, fascinating gay porn history. And I've learned a lot from it, both in terms of just like totally fun, like uh, sometimes gross, sometimes hot, uh, sometimes like utterly chaotic porn, but also just like the, all of the history that kind of like inserts itself into the background and is like insistent um, in the ways that everyone is interacting. Um, okay, so we have some time for questions. Um, we have a question from Jean. Uh, thank you for two amazing presentations. My question is, if you could design your utopian cinema experience, a movie theater or something else, what would it be? Practical, conceptual, top snack options. Um, we do need to know about the snacks. Um, and Elizabeth, I think you're unmuted still. Okay, there we go. Cool. I mean, it, it's kind of funny that you you mentioned that because my partner is working on a piece they've wanted to write about the history of uh, bathhouse buffets <laughs> because that is a that is a tradition that goes back decades is like the free buffet at the bathhouse or the uh the free sandwiches at the movie p uh, premiere at the the gay porno theater <laughs> <laughs> what is like what is in your bathhouse buffet like do you have any like immediate things that come to mind Oh God, I don't even know. <laughs> um, I would hope good coffee. I would say that good coffee. Uh -huh. It's beautiful. We just need a coffee pot. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, <laughs> crack about chili. That's um, that's like deeply upsetting to imagine a crack pot chili situation at the best. <laughs> <laughs> um. Are there any other questions for Elizabeth? Or Elizabeth, do you have any other thoughts on your utopian cinema experience? Would it be a movie theater, like as as we conceptualize it now, or would it be something else? I mean, the film programmer in me will always say yes, a movie theater. Uh -huh. uh, especially because I don't know, as someone with AD, ADD, I, I can't watch stuff at home properly. I have to see it mm -hmm. with a crowd too. Um, Last night, I screened a long lost film by Warhol superstar Hollywood Line at the uh, Alamo here in Austin. And I will say that the film was much, much more entertaining and enjoyable with a crowd than it was just watching it by myself at home uh, a few months ago. So I will always be for the group experience, especially if we're talking about like porno stuff too. Totally. Um, I have a question, which is, I think, um, kind of like towards the beginning of your talk, you mentioned how like so much of like queer film programming is like very cynical. Like it's just kind of like we're going to like do this one thing like during this one special time. Like, do you have any advice for programmers who are interested in programming things that like don't have an audience built in or like are like kind of more like big risks like programming something at the Alamo is like kind of scary maybe because that like wouldn't necessarily be their audience yeah I mean to me I think risk is an inherent part of film programming I think it's to me I mean to me it's almost one of the most exciting things you you're putting something on the line either money or your credibility or your tastes like how people view your tastes and hopefully it pays off and hopefully people will come out and hopefully people will like the movie and it feels great when they do but I mean I just, I am very loud online about my desire for there to be more queer film programming because there's so many of these films that are just at risk of just disappearing forever unless they're being played in theaters and where people can see them. I mean, I think something just being released on DVD isn't really enough because you have to go out and seek it out. It's not just, it's not a, you have one chance to see this in a theater and if you don't, yeah, you know? Totally. 
Are there any other questions? I will say too, uh, just going back to the crock pot chili. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the Big Top Theater in New York, which I mentioned in the piece, uh, they had a restaurant built inside the theater with their own branded cheeseburger called the Queen Burger. And it was the restaurant was called the Cafe Espresso and the ads and the TV commercials because they advertised on public access. So uh, home of the Queen Burger, the Cafe Espresso, where you can always find a good piece of meat day or night. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they know their audience. Um, Jean says, FYI, crackpot chili was always available at the boiler room at Gay Bar on 4th <laughs> Street in East Village. Of course, fries at Julia is very delicious as well. I love like, like we are going to have like messy, disgusting sex and we also are going to eat messy, disgusting food. Like we are committed <laughs> to like the most like vile, reprehensible behaviors. <laughs> Look, um, it's it's free. We're not spending money, <laughs> too much money on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, totally. Um, all right. Well, on this like wonderful note of like the utopian theater that maybe has like an overflowing pot of ch of chili, um, <laughs> I want to thank uh, both of you so much for joining us and sharing your visions. And um, I so look forward to the work that um, both of you do, continuing to like disrupt all of these um, heinous norms of the way that films are made and distributed and screened um, and just like appreciate both of you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. And also to James and Anna for holding Oh it. yeah, James like and Anna. James starting the party off with that, that uh, music was like taking me somewhere I've never been before. It was taking me to the bathhouse <laughs> to eat crackpot chili. Was that why I'm or was it? Harumi Hosano. It sounds familiar. I'm just curious. Yeah, James, you gotta drop drop the info. That sinister emoji. <laughs> um wow, I love it. Okay, we got a YouTube link, so we can be rocking out to this all night. <laughs> Doing our nasty things to this music all night. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much. Um we will see you again sometime at the the virtual poetry project. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.